July 14, 1789, over 7,000 citizens of France stormed into the Bastille in Paris. After killing all the soldiers, they dragged the governor of the Bastille through the streets, beat him up, and then decapitated him. His head was placed on a pike and paraded through the city. The revolution had begun. The French Revolution, starting with the storming of the Bastille and ending with the death of Maximilien Robespierre, spanned over five years. It tells the story of how the people decided to take their destiny into their own hands. Rebel against feudal authority and create a new republic. Many died. The streets of France were stained in blood. To understand what brought about the revolution, we need to go back in time. 1774 The ascension of King Louis XVI of the Bourbon family to the throne of France. Having become king at the tender age of twenty, he had no idea of how to manage a kingdom. King Louis was married to Mary Antoinette of Austria. Both Louis and Mary led an extravagant life in their palace at Versailles. They remained unaware of the pitiful situation of the people in their kingdom. In one day, the royal household used to consume food that could feed a person for a month. In addition to the expenditure made by the royal family, King Louis decided to support the American War of Independence in their war against Britain, France's old enemy. In doing this, he increased France's debt to over three billion livres. To King Louis, the answer was simple. Levi more taxes. The 18th century society in France was divided into three estates. The first estate consisted of the clergy. The second estate comprised of the nobility. And the third estate, which formed about 97% of the population, consisted of the merchants, officials, peasants, artisans, and servants. The clergy and nobility did not have to pay any taxes. So, it was the third estate that had to bear all the brunt of Louis' taxes. To be born as a member of the third estate during those times was a curse. They had to pay taxes to the king and state, taxes to the clergy called tithes, a direct tax called tile to the state, and taxes to their nobles as feudal dues from the peasants. Their taxes literally ran the state. However, not all members of the third estate were poor. A very small fraction called the middle class was also a part of the third estate. This group consisted of educated people such as teachers, lawyers, artisans and merchants. They started to question the privileges being enjoyed by the nobility. Jacques Rousseau, an eminent philosopher of the time, wrote against the doctrine of the divine and the absolute right of the king. He and others like him dreamt of a society that provided freedom, equality, and opportunity for everyone 
irrespective of which estate they were part of. Montesquieu, another philosopher of the time, actually wrote a book called The Spirit of the Laws, where he recommended that instead of the authority only being in the hands of the king, government authority needed to be divided into three wings the legislative, the executive, and the judiciary. John Locke, yet another philosopher of that era, is known for his famous book, Two Treaties of Government, that sought to invalidate the principle of total power and authority of the king. So there was a growing sense of discontentment across all fractions of the third estate, right from the peasant to the merchant. All of them wanted change. In the midst of all these thoughts, the state decided in addition to the existing taxes to increase the price of bread. This was the last straw. People started fighting for bread. These bread riots, as they were called, increased to such an extent that anyone who hoarded bread was caught and killed. This led to a subsistence crisis, which means prime means of survival was threatened. This is caused due to reasons like bad harvest, epidemics and price hike, leading to a large gap between the rich and the poor. King Louis knew that the economy was in shambles. People were rioting on the streets. As a solution, he decided to convene the Estates General and put forth his proposal. However, as you will see later, this was just the beginning of a long list of problems that he was to face. Soon, the people of France were unhappy. They had just been hit by the worst winter, destroying their entire crop. Bread prices were at an all-time high. And to top it all, King Louis was planning on increasing taxes. Louis had almost bankrupted France with the three million lever debt. He was planning to increase taxes to offset this. But to do this, he needed to first get permission from all the three estates. So he decided to convene the estates general. No monarch had done this during the previous 150 years, the last time actually being in 1614, which ended in a failure. The Estates General was convened on the 5th of May, 1789, at Versailles. It consisted of representatives from all the three estates. Three hundred members from the first estate or the clergy attended. The same number of people from the second estate or nobles attended. In contrast, the third estate was represented by 600 people. The prosperous and educated members of the third estate were allowed to stand at the back. The rest of the third estate was not even allowed admission to the proceedings. They, however, were allowed to send in their grievances as letters. There were 40,000 letters of grievances. King Louis wanted the old style of voting where each estate had just one vote, which meant that as the third estate had only one vote, any resolution could be passed easily, as both the clergy and nobles would support him. The third estate was against this. They were inspired by the philosophy put forth by Rousseau in his book, The Social Contract, and stated that the entire assembly needed to vote. 
with each member casting one vote. King Louis refused. The members of the third estate were enraged and walked out of the meeting. They gathered in an indoor tennis court on the 20th of June, 1789, in Versailles, and declared the birth of the National Assembly. They swore not to leave until a constitution was drafted. Their key leaders were Mirabeau and Abbe Saez. The oath was administered by Bailey. Another prominent member was Robespierre, who rose to prominence during the later stages of the revolution. While the constitution was being drafted, the people of France were still suffering. The price of bread had skyrocketed and bread riots were common. Bakeries were being looted. King Louis was worried. To contain the revolt, he mobilized his troops to move to Paris. The revolt finally took a violent turn when, on 14 July 1789, a crowd of 7,000 people stormed the Bastille, a prison that stood for everything that they hated. The governor and all the guards of the Bastille were massacred. The people demolished the Bastille by hand, and the bricks were sold to be kept as a memento of the revolution. Seeing all this, Louis suddenly feared the power and resolve of the people, and on August 4, 1789, he finally recognized the National Assembly and agreed to abide by their framework. The National Assembly abolished the feudal system of taxes, tithes, and the special privileges that were enjoyed by the clergy and nobles by birth. In doing this, over two million livres were recovered. The prices of bread dropped, and the people of France were happy again. Man is born free, yet everywhere he is in chains now said Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Today, we all take liberty and freedom of expression for granted. This was not the case in the 18th century France, where the people had to fight for freedom from the years of oppression under the feudal lords. So, the recognition of the National Assembly by King Louis and him agreeing to their demands was a victory for the entire third estate. With the abolition of special privileges, tithes, and feudal taxes, people were happier as a huge burden had been lifted off them. The next thing on the agenda of the National Assembly was the creation of a constitution. They completed this in 1791. As per the new constitution, France became a constitutional monarchy with the king or the executive having to share power with the legislature and the judiciary. King Louis, however, continued to retain the executive powers. Not everyone could vote as per the new constitution. Only men who were older than 25 years and who paid taxes were allowed to vote. This did not go well with people like Jean-Paul Marat, who criticized it vehemently in his paper, stating that the government was represented only by the rich. Marat's writings were so fierce that he was made a member of the National Assembly so as to calm him. The Constitution commenced with the Declaration of the Rights of Man. It stated that the right to life, to freedom of speech, to freedom of opinion, and to equality before the law were intrinsic to all human beings. 
But remember that the majority of the people of France at that period were uneducated and could not read or write. Visual symbols were used to share the message to them. The broken chains stood for freedom. The blue, white and red symbolized the national colors of France. The red Phrygian cap was a sign of freedom and was worn by slaves when they became free. The all-seeing eye stood for knowledge. The self-devouring snake indicated eternity. The bundle of rods of fasces indicated strength in unity. The winged woman stood for the law. The scepter was a symbol of royal power. The tablet, also known as the law tablet, signified equality. Using these political symbols, the important ideas were communicated to the masses. With the creation of the Constitution and the Declaration of Mankind, King Louis' powers reduced drastically. However, as you will see later on, he had plans of his own. The people of France were happy. The National Assembly had succeeded in making France into a constitutional monarchy. However, having been stripped of almost all his powers, King Louis was not happy. He decided to launch a campaign with the help of Austria. As Queen Mary Antoinette was from the Austrian royal family. Louis was sure that if they were to reach Austria, they would be safe. So Louis and his family disguised themselves as peasants and headed off to Austria. Unfortunately, the revolutionists came to know of the plan. The king and queen were caught near the border of France before they could enter Austria. They were brought back to Paris. The people of Paris were enraged and now lost all faith in their royal family. The National Assembly decided to wage war on Austria. Lots of volunteers came to fight from the neighboring regions. Patriotic songs such as the Marseillaise were sung. Marseillaise was composed by Roger de la Isle and is now the national anthem of France. It was about during this time that Maximilien Robespierre came into the forefront of the revolution. A lawyer by profession, he was a strong orator and was the head of the Jacobin Club. The Jacobins included members from the lesser prosperous middle class. They considered themselves different. Jacobins were also called sans which meant those without knee breeches. They wore long striped trousers similar to dock workers and wore a red Phrygian cap that symbolized liberty. Meanwhile, the war was still going on with Austria. Prussia too entered the war as an ally to Austria. The expenses of the war raised the prices of food again. High prices and shortage of food angered the Parisians. On August 10th, 1792, thousands of people stormed the palace of the Tourelles, where King Louis and his family were staying. All the king's guards were massacred, 
and the king just barely managed to escape. The National Assembly stripped King Louis of all his powers and imprisoned him and his family. On September 21, 1792, a new assembly called the Convention was formed and France was declared a republic. Now that King Louis was imprisoned and that France was in the hands of the people, one would have expected that things would only get better. It got worse. The year immediately following the formation of the French Republic is referred to as the Reign of Terror. Hundreds died during this period. And they were all killed using the dreaded guillotine, a machine that was used for beheading people. The National Committee, now called the Convention and headed by Robespierre, felt that the best way to start the new republic was to execute the king. So they put King Louis on trial and found him guilty. He was allowed to spend his last moments with his family. On January 21st, 1793, King Louis was beheaded, his charge being the conspiracy against public liberty and the general safety. Marie Antoinette was also guillotined on October 16th of the same year. The monarchy was no more. King Louis was executed on the 21st of January, 1793, at the Palace de la Concorde, followed by the execution of the Queen. The year immediately following the formation of the French Republic is actually referred to as the Reign of Terror. Hundreds died during this period. Maximilien Robespierre, now head of the Committee of Public Safety, felt that there were lots of enemies of the revolution plotting against France. He suspended the Declaration of the Rights of Man and started executing people he suspected of counter-terrorist activities. Thousands of people were imprisoned and killed during this period. Even the clergy and members of his own party were not spared. With every passing day, more and more people were killed. At the peak of the reign of terror, over 25 people were being guillotined daily. Even Antoine Lavoisier, the man who is considered the father of modern chemistry and who is famous for discovering oxygen and hydrogen, was executed during this period. On the economic front, Robespierre's government enforced a maximum ceiling on wages and prices, and the peasants were forced to sell grains at a fixed price of the government. Meat and bread were rationed, and the use of white flour was banned. Only whole wheat bread, known as equality bread, was allowed. Furthermore, churches were shut down and the buildings converted into barracks. Equality was practiced even through speech, where instead of Madame and Monsieur, Citoyenne and Citoyen were used. Camille Desmoulins, a revolutionary journalist of that time, had conflicting views on Robespierre's government and voiced his thoughts openly. He was against guillotining people and believed that liberty could be achieved with more humane methods. Robespierre was the exact opposite. He believed that liberty could be achieved through terror. Desmoulin was eventually executed during the Reign of Terror. Finally, the supporters of Robespierre had enough. 
in July 1794, he was charged with treason and sentenced to death. Robespierre was guillotined facing the blade so that he could see death approaching him. And with the death of Robespierre ended the reign of terror. Women have played a silent but key role in times of crisis. Whether it was putting bread on the table or fighting for their rights, they did it all. However, the participation of women in the revolutions has never been stressed upon much. Women came into the forefront on October 5, 1789, when they marched to Versailles and brought King Louis XVI back to Paris. They wanted the king and government closer so they could keep an eye on their activities to voice their opinions and interests. Political clubs were set up all over France. Of the 60 women's clubs that were initiated, the Society of Revolutionary and Republican Women was the most popular. The key issues raised by the Society of Revolutionary and Republican Women was equal political rights for women similar to the rights assigned to men. Though many laws were introduced to improve the lives of women, like schools made compulsory for girls, marriage of own preference, divorce legalized, job training for women, yet the women folk were unhappy with the Constitution of 1791. They felt they were reduced to mere passive citizens, denying them the right to vote. Spearheading the cause of women from 1791 onwards was the eminent writer and political activist, Olamp de Goes. She fervently opposed the Constitution and the Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen of 1791, as it completely ignored the rights of women. The Jacobin government rejected the demand for equal rights to women and sought to shut down all women's clubs across France. Olympe de Gauze subsequently drafted the Declaration of Rights for Women and Citizen in the same year and addressed it to the Queen and the National Assembly. She also criticized the Jacobin government for forcibly shutting down all women's clubs. Olympe de Gauze was charged with treason and on November 2nd, 1793, she was sentenced to the guillotine by the National Convention. Another eminent lady in the history of the French Revolution who was guillotined in 1793 was Charlotte Corday. She assassinated Jean-Paul Marat, the Jacobin leader who was also responsible for the reign of terror. The revolution carried out by the women of France triggered revolutionary movements in many countries around the world, including the international suffrage movement. For the next two centuries, although French women fought for equal rights since 1789. It was only two centuries later, in 1946, that they won the right to exercise their franchise and equal wages. Maximilien Robespierre, whose tyranny in the French Revolution is remembered across generations, was also responsible for bringing about a revolutionary social reform the abolition of slavery in the French colonies. Even before the French Revolution, in 1789, France had three colonies of the Caribbean, Martinique, Guadeloupe, and San Domingo under its control. 
these places were major suppliers of sugar, coffee, indigo, and tobacco. As Europeans were reluctant to work in far-off lands, there was a shortage of labor at the plantations in these colonies. This led to the formation of a triangular slave trade between Europe, Africa, and America, which began in the 17th century. Merchants sailed from the French ports to the African coast, where they bought Negroes, who were natives of Africa, from the local chieftains. In today's world, the word Negro is an offensive and racist term. We refer to them as Africans or African Americans. The slaves were then cramped into ships and transported to the French colonies in the Caribbean, where they were sold off by the plantation owners. This led to an increase in the population of black people in the Caribbean when compared to the whites. Port cities like Bordeaux and Nantes were flourishing economically because of the slave trade. Frustrated by the treatment meted out to them, many slaves fled from their colonies and formed a community called the Maroons or Runaways. Foreseeing a rebellion in the French colonies of the Caribbean, the National Assembly discussed the views of extending the rights of man to these colonies as well. Several deputies in the National Assembly supported the proposal to abolish the slave trade, but no action was taken. The agitated slaves of San Domingo began a rebellion against France. They made deals with Britain and Spain to join their armies and fight against the French. Keeping the current state of affairs in mind, the National Convention, headed by Robespierre, voted to abolish slavery in all the French colonies on February 4, 1794. Unfortunately, slavery was reintroduced ten years later by Napoleon Bonaparte. The measure to finally abolish slavery in the French colonies came 44 years later, in 1848, by the French Second Republic. The years following the revolution of 1789 saw many changes in the lives of the French in the way they dressed, the language they spoke, and the books they read. After the storming of the Bastille in July 1789, a law was passed by the revolutionary government abolishing censorship. This came as a breath of fresh air for the thinking intelligentsia, who were not able to give vent to their opinion on various things, especially during this period of political turmoil in France. The government took up the responsibility to put into practice the ideologies of liberty, equality, and fraternity. This replaced the rule followed in the old regime, where written materials such as books, newspapers, and cultural activities, like plays, could be performed only after an approval from the censors of the king. If disapproved, they were burnt and destroyed. The Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, contained in the preamble of the Constitution of 1791, asserted that every citizen had the right to freedom of speech and expression, which was his natural right. Subsequently, the press played a crucial role in the dispersal of written material such as newspapers, books, pamphlets, and pictures throughout France.
for the benefit of the majority of the members of the third estate who could not read and write. Printed pictures and paintings were circulated and pamphlets and books read aloud to them. Plays, songs and processions made it easy for the common people to grasp the revolutionary ideals of liberty, equality and justice. Freedom of the press in the Declaration of 1791 supported the right to oppose views of events. This also paved way for political clubs to convince the others of their position through the medium of print. The French Revolution had a huge impact on the history of France in many ways than one. A warrior, emperor, despot who changed the face of Europe. A man of conviction, Napoleon Bonaparte was one of the greatest military leaders in history. He emerged out of the revolutionary wars and became the new savior of France. Born in 1769 in the island of Corsica, Napoleon Bonaparte studied in a military school in Paris. He earned his fame in his Italian campaigns. The directory that was formed after the fall of the Jacobin government in 1794 lacked political stability and this paved the way for the rise of the military dictator Napoleon Bonaparte. In 1799 he led a coup known as 18 Brumaire and became the first consul. Subsequently by 1804 he was made Emperor of France. During his reign, he conquered a number of dynasties in the neighboring European countries and placed his family members to take charge. He codified the French law under the name the Napoleonic Code of Law, which gave rights to protect private property and initiated the uniform system of weights and measures. He also centralized the government and reinstated Roman Catholicism as the state religion. He was regarded as a redeemer bringing liberty for the people. However, over the course of time, his armies began to be viewed as an invading force into the lives of the people of France. He was defeated by Nelson, the commander of the British Army, in the Battle of Nile and at the Battle of Trafalgar. The Battle of Waterloo in 1815 was Napoleon's final defeat. He was imprisoned by the Duke of Wellington in the island of St. Helena, where he eventually died in 1821. The ideals of liberty, equality and fraternity formed the touchstone of the French Revolution and many of Napoleon's revolutionary ideas had a long-lasting impact on France and the people. These ideologies spread from France across the rest of Europe and also to other colonized societies across the world.